Hey, how's it going everybody? We're back again here with another episode of the Let's Play series. And today's episode is definitely uh, one of those like mega grind episodes. Uh, if you remember last time we were working on this ultimate enchanting uh, system. And since the last time you can see, I got it pretty much all built here, right? It's very, very large, very expensive, all the redstone components. And you gotta uh, like finically put them all together here and... Uh, I think it's functionally pretty close to ready, but there's still a lot of other stuff we need to do with this thing. This is our plan for our librarian trading hall. First off, get a couple villagers in this area. We put down a bunch of beds, fed them bread, and they have multiplied into bajillions of villagers. We need at least uh, about 40 or so, one for each type of enchanted book. Now, we're getting them pushed into these little compartments. Every once in a while, they'll wander in on their own. Oh, like this guy did. Oh, and if I'm quick enough, I can block them in. I failed that time. This time, I got him. Aha, you're trapped. Look at that. And then I put a trap door here, and he cannot escape because he's two blocks tall and he can't fit through that. Then, when I want to go hunting for the books we need, I block it off so no other villagers can steal the lectern I'm about to put down. Only the guy in front of us. We put it down, and he becomes a librarian. Okay, now I'm not happy with these trades, so this is going to take a little bit of uh, finessing, right? Here's an example of a librarian that I think is uh, about perfect for what we want here. He's got a useful enchanted book trade. He's got the bookshelf trade and the glass trade. If it doesn't have those three things, it's not a keeper, okay? <laughs> so that's what we're hunting for here. Now, in order to get that, we're going to have to break the lectern and put it down multiple times. And as we get closer to getting exactly what we want, it's going to become more difficult. This is perfect. We need unbreaking three. Now, I'm keeping a log as well as we go along here, of which ones we've gotten already, so I don't accidentally double up. And uh, you can see Unbreaking 3 is not on our list here, so that's one we need. Now, I'm not doing the curing before. I'm, I'm paying full price here just to make sure that he will actually get a glass trade, right? So let's check out if we can get a glass trade here. Ideally, we would like a lectern trade as well, so that's perfect here. Cool. I'm going to trade for that. We're getting the emeralds from our other villager system nearby. And we got the glass trade. Awesome. Okay, so then in that case, he's a keeper. We're going to add him to our list here. Un Unbreaking three. Cool. Efficiency five. That's another good one. Let's go for it. We need that. Now we need the glass trade here. Did we get it? We did not get it. Disappointment. So we got the perfect book we need here we got the bookshelf but we did not get the glass so guess what happens to mr uh mr useless here he just gets gets a little uh, shower so we don't want to kill the villagers ourselves because then the iron golems will get mad at us and also um it'll affect their trade prices they'll go up right so let's uh let's just use the water bucket <laughs> and because we're missing a villager now, the ones that are wandering around out here should breed another one to, to replace the missing one. For this episode especially, I'm going to be skipping through a lot of the boring, grindy parts. Uh, if you've done villagers before, you know they can take quite a bit of time. And uh, especially when you're doing them like 40 librarians at once and you're being picky with them. Uh, I ended up spending about three hours, I'd say, tr trying to lock in the, the trades I wanted. And 2307 broken lecterns later, uh, breaking and replacing them, we were probably at about... 200 or so before we started. We have finally gotten our villager hall trades all locked in. So they're exactly the way I want. We have a useful book trade, bookshelf trade, and glass trade with all the villagers. As many of you know, I find uh, game mechanics especially interesting, and I like to learn like why why things are the way they are, or what's, what's something unique and quirky about the game, or that I can exploit to play the game better. <laughs> you know, I, I love that stuff, and I'm, I'm all about it. While doing this project, I did come across a couple things I found interesting I thought I would share with you. Uh, number one, I, I had no idea. Some of you might know this, but apparently you can get the same book trade from the same villager multiple times. So we got two Depth Strider 3 trades from the same villager here. And you can get up to four uh, enchanted book trades from a villager if you're lucky. And I think that means you can get four of the exact same book trade if you're like astronomically lucky. Like it... You know how people collect rare mobs in this game? If you want a rare mob, try to get one with the exact same trade four times. <laughs> uh huh. I, I'm guessing it's possible, uh, but a huge waste of time. Uh, anyways, 
That was interesting to me. I had a hunch about something else before I started this, and now that I've done it, I'm like way more convinced it's true. Uh, not all the trades you get from the villagers have the same weighting. Some of them are way more common, and some are way more rare. An example of a common one is like Curse of Binding, or Multi-Shot seems to be very common. Channeling, even Mending is fairly common. And what's not common is like the higher level stuff, like Efficiency 5 is rare. Sharpness 5 is rare, and especially for me, <laughs> I had an incredibly difficult time finding Impaling 5. That seems to be the rarest, or I might have just got unlucky. Um, and I got like 3 or 4 of them total in those 3 hours, while I got like maybe 15 or 16 Efficiency 5 trades, right, in that same amount of time. Uh, but of those 3 or 4, all of them failed at uh, being the perfect villager I was looking for, so I gave up and... Uh, this is the one flawed villager we have that doesn't have the book trade. I'm not wasting more time on it. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on here, our next goal with the villagers is to start curing them, which isn't going to be all that simple either, because we got to get rid of all the extra villagers here. To do that, I'm going to try to remove all the beds and then start like corralling them together with water. The reason we're trying to move these extra villagers instead of just killing them all is because uh, we're not done setting up our trading system. We're going to need more villagers for that. And it's kind of wasteful just to breed them, kill them, and then have to breed them again later. Although moving them might not be any faster. Because <laughs> they're very frustrating. We got all the extra villagers relocated down into that hole there using uh, water buckets and tunnels. And now every villager remaining up here are the ones we actually want to keep and cure. Yeah, so we got about 40 villagers there. We need to cure each five times to get their trade prices as low as possible. So we're looking at like 200 golden apples we need to craft. Now, if you ever need golden apples, don't forget you can buy apples from the farmers a stack at a time. And that, that saves so much time. <laughs> like if you were to try to actually harvest the trees for the apples, oh man. Nope, 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 don't do that. Okay, we got uh, we got a bunch here. We're actually going to need like three stacks of gold to do this. Like, it's not cheap. Another cool little trick I've learned is try use baby zombies for the curing process. It makes it a little easier because they can fit through uh, stuff that the villagers can't. So check this out. I got a wall set up to keep our villagers in place, right? All I need to do to get the, the baby zombie in there is to... Actually, let's do it like this. I'm going to go up by two. I'm going to jump over here. Where you, what are you doing, buddy? He's going to run in, and then I'm going to just lock him in. And guess what happens when he can't see me anymore? <laughs> he starts going to work. Might be able to get them all with just one potion here. Hopefully. Now, I should be able to go away from them and not worry about them despawning, because uh, I've traded with every single one of those guys. If you trade with them, you don't have to worry about them despawning. Um, but I'm just going to do a count here and see how many different villagers we actually have. So 41, and I've used 41 golden apples. We had a full stack, so I, I know I hit every single one of them that way. They got golden particles now, which is pretty fancy. It's kind of a small thing, but it makes it a lot easier to see when they're done converting. Mm, actually, you can come over here. So you can talk to them to get them to follow you a little bit. Then I use water. <laughs> this is like the, the most challenging part of the whole project. Trying to get these guys into alphabetical order in their holding areas. We need that to happen. Otherwise, the shulker box with the enchanted books in won't be in alphabetical order at the end of this. Um, okay. But we got the, the villagers cured five times. And now uh, we're just trying to get them into their places here. I use the water to do that. I trap them in. I've been name tagging them as well. It is done, everybody. My goodness, that was brutal. <laughs> Trying to get them in alphabetical order of all things. Uh, yeah, in total, we got 26 tool enchantment villagers, and there is uh, 16 armor enchantment villagers, although we're missing two because obviously you can't get swift sneak or soul speed from villagers in the game, at least not currently. So we got to get the lecterns down so that they're able to refresh their trades, but I want to make sure they actually grab the correct lectern. I'm not just going to uh, put them down and risk like someone across the hall there grabbing the, and stealing the lectern from somebody and then 
they can never refresh your trades because they get locked onto it or something, right? Uh, I want to make sure we do this properly. So I'm going to go one by one here. Break the mushroom block, put down the lectern. And does it give you any kind of indicator, like green particles, if it's done right? I don't know. I thought it did. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, yeah, we got green particles. Okay. Did you not get green particles for some reason, or did I miss them? I don't want to mess this part up. Okay, yeah, green particles. Awesome. Very good. So we got the librarian villagers all finished up there. And I tell you what, I need a break from those guys. <laughs> from that project. I've been there for far too long. And uh, I need to do something else. Something fun. Something exciting. Maybe even something dangerous. Uh-huh. I have an experiment here I've been wanting to try for quite a while. And today's the day. We're doing it. Now, this is one of those ideas that's so dumb, it might just be dumb enough to work. It might be brilliant. We'll see. Uh, possibly, I might save a lot of people a lot of time here. Because I have noticed a common problem in the Minecraft community where everybody seems to love Deep Slate. This stuff is great, right? It's a nice building block. People use it for houses, for roads, for everything. But they never seem to have enough of it. Mm -hmm. So here's the plan. This is what we're doing. Um, we're trying to make a better method than just mining deep slate with your pick because that's what suckers do right we won't we don't want to be a sucker um the other option for getting deep slate probably the best one is to make some kind of mining machine but that also involves like a huge amount of setup time um it involves like possibly blowing it up if you build it wrong <laughs> and it involves duping tnt which is a, a big no-no for me and for, for probably a lot of people um that you don't want to do that in your world so we're trying to find another option here. Here's the plan. We have a hopper clock and an ender porter. And we're able to jump down this hole to the deep slate cavern below. And uh, we're going to try use withers to mine the deep slate for us. Um, so there's a few, few things to this. So you see, after a certain amount of time, we can get teleported back up to the surface. That's the first, first little trick here. I'm going to extend the time on this a bit. Um, the thing about withers, they cannot mine deep slate. Like, they don't really drop the deep slate block when they blow it up with their black bullets. The black bullets are the ones that target you and that target mobs. We, we need them to shoot blue bullets, which are the ones that can, like, destroy anything. And uh, they only shoot those when they don't have any targets. And that doesn't really work underground because hostile mobs are always spawning. So that's why we're trying to do this in a mushroom biome where hostile mobs don't really spawn underground. I think another good option for this idea would be to do it in an ancient city, like where the warden spawns, because uh, that's a big open area full of deep slate that also doesn't spawn hostile mobs. So the, the withers won't constantly be getting distracted. Okay, so I'm nervous about this, by the way. <laughs> you can see hostile mobs are spawning over there. I'm getting a little close to the area. Um, but yeah, hopefully they don't really go that way. But yeah, I'm going to have to run along here. Spawn in all the withers. You got to make sure when the withers spawn, you're not within their blast radius. Because that will kill you instantly. Um, I need to kind of get out of here before they really go nuts on me. So my plan is just to hide. <laughs> and let the ender porter take me up. And then uh, I'll do this in a different way. Oh man, this they can't get away from these things. Okay. I'm just gonna hide here for a bit. Okay. We're back up to the surface. Spawn is set. Yep, yep. And now my plan is to take off all my gear. Okay? I want to make sure there's no chance of losing it. I'm trying to like I was trying to figure out a method of doing this without needing to set up a resistance beacon and all that stuff as well. And I think I'd have I have the method now. Okay. So there's no risk of losing anything. I will take a couple couple carrots just for healing. And we want what else here? I want invisibility. And I want to set the ender porter again. So they're down there. They're they're mining for us right now, I believe. And uh, we're free to hop down. We got everything off. Yep. Yeah, I reset the ender porter. Gonna take an invisibility potion. And now, even though I don't have feather falling or anything, I don't have to worry because I set up a water thing here and they should kind of just ignore me <laughs> I 
Um, but I can get hit by stray random blue bullets, which do a bit of damage. I have to watch out. Whoa! Golden apple, instant health potion, just in case we need it. And I'm going to try and not get so close to the withers this time as well. Kind of uh, stay away from them. But yeah, I should be free to just like wander around here and pick up stuff, I think. Like they're ignoring me, <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh, except I'm getting hit by... I keep getting hit by random stuff I'm not seeing. Well, that bullet's close to me. Okay. But look how much work they're doing. Oh, I got hit by something bad. Is he on me? Does he see me? Oh, he must have saw me. Look at all this stuff, though. Like, there's so many blocks on the ground. <laughs> and uh, that's only, like, 30 withers or so. Like, we could put even more down here. Okay, I think they might be seeing the stuff in my hand when I pick it up, and then they target me. I'm going to try to keep it off my bar. No! I needed more time! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, this, this is a balancing act that's going to take a while to get used to. If you accidentally teleport up too soon, it's not a big deal. It just costs you one, one ender pearl. Okay, we're going to teleport soon. Let's get as much as we can quickly, quickly. We're starting to get, like, good amount, good runs here. Like, multiple stacks per run. Ooh, out of my way. And they seem to be spreading out more now. Oh. Oh, I'm targeted. I'm targeted. Teleport quickly. Go, 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 go. Run, 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 run. I might teleport. I might teleport. Ah! <laughs> How much was left on this? Maybe I forgot to put the, the pearl in. Okay, so I think this has potential. I just don't think I have figured it out entirely yet. Um, It's a lot more fun than mining, I will say. <laughs> I'm having a good time doing this, actually. Uh, but it needs work, right? There's there's some issues here. Uh, look at all those items over there, though. Look at them all. I know if I go there, I'm dead. I'm pretty sure. But I gotta try. Take the items up. Oh, no, he teleported me too soon. I'm gonna try to make a break for where all the items are this time. This is dangerous, but I gotta do it. Look at them all over there. Look at them all. No! No, I want him! I want the... I want the deep slate! Oh, ho, ho. Stacks upon stacks! And then we teleport right now! No! Wait, no, I, we did teleport! <laughs> okay, we got him. Nice. Alright, I think I got a good handle on it now. I'm actually living long enough my potions are running out. How about that? I actually gotta refresh them. <laughs> And I've uh, made the timer longer because I can last longer down there. Basically, the trick is pretty simple. Just don't get close to the withers. Stay like five to eight blocks away from them and you're perfectly fine. Um, and just try to go pick off areas they've been instead of areas that they are. Like, this is kind of as close as I want to get to that guy. Because once they start targeting you, you're you're dead. My withers have really spread out, though. They they saw the hostile mobs, and then they kind of went all out here. <laughs> so I might need to add more uh, to the quarry here. But it also makes it a lot easier to pick up stuff, because they're not so clustered together now. They're really spread out, and there's kind of just blocks everywhere now. Alright, cool. Another successful run. About 10 stacks or so. Yeah, it's uh, it's going good now. It is time, everybody. I'm in the mood to do a little bit of building, and I gotta say, you know, I don't mind having long-term projects in my world. It's a long-term series, right? That's that's to be expected. I love having, like, lots of stuff on the go all the time. But, I gotta say, even I have some standards. <laughs> I'll be very disappointed in myself if uh, by the time the next World Tour comes out and Sandy City isn't finished still... Even though this is like a side project, I rarely work on it. Let, let's try to get it done, shall we? Uh, I'm gonna add the final house into the corner here today. The problem with not finishing a build for a very long time is it gets really weird when you go back to it and you want to work on it, and it's like, oh, this is strange. I don't even know if I can build like that anymore. <laughs> or even if I could, I don't know if I would want to, right? Like, your building style changes a little bit over time, whether you like it or not. 
And especially when they add new blocks to the game, uh, you find new combinations you like, and it's like, man, I wish I had that back then. Do I update it? Is it worth updating? Then I gotta change everything. Or you might want to, like, build larger scale, and it's like, well, I can't do that. I can't have one of the houses three times larger than all the other ones. It's not gonna, not gonna fit the build, right? <laughs> so you kind of just gotta go back, emulate the old style, whether you like it or not. And uh, just be happy with it. So I'm, I think out of the buildings I made, probably that one and this one is my favorite. So I'm trying to emulate these uh, the best I can. And I'm just like trying to follow the rules to it. I'm pretty good at copying stuff, right? So I, I look and it's like, okay, chiseled, stair. I can do that. That's not a big deal. And uh, just kind of relearn the old, uh, old style I went with here. I'm questioning why I've never done this before. If you put the log in your offhand, axe in the main hand, you can actually just hold right click and it'll like auto strip it. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, snappers, are you guys ready to check out the final build, the finishing touch we needed for Sandy City? It's done. We got it all built up here and the style ended up actually being very similar to the one we were trying to copy, so I'm happy about that, but I think it's different enough that uh, uh, it's good. Like, I don't want them to be the same. I want some unique differences between them, such as, check it out, we got like mushrooms and mud on the ground, and then because of the, the coloring here, we put in some jungle wood and jungle wood up there, and believe it or not, even mangrove doors, that's a little different. Uh, yeah, Sandy City's not done though. <laughs> still gotta do the interiors on all the buildings. We gotta do some decorating out here. There's some big empty spaces still. Um, and probably just some touching up and polishing all around the build here would be nice. Uh, but we're getting close. Uh, okay, we got a side entrance to the second story over here, which I think is pretty cool. I like this. And, uh, little back alley area here. Uh, but yeah, we go up to the second story onto the balcony. We got like uh, sun protection again, like the other builds have. And we'll walk around here, look out at the city. We got our pickles, or maybe their baby cacti growing in a big cluster. Could be, could be. Um, and then we got uh, access to another empty room <laughs> with uh, side access to the wall so that uh, you can go out on patrol or do whatever. And uh, that's about it, I would say. A lot of building for not much of a reveal, I gotta say. <laughs> Seems like it always goes that way. Uh, the only problem... This is something I don't like about Sandy City. It looks so brown from above. I need to, like, add different colors into the roofs or something. I don't know. Well, anyways, everybody, we're gonna have to wrap up our episode here for today. But before we do, let's read the comment of the day, which says, Whatever happened to Race for the Wool? I would love to see a resurgence of that game. Me too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is a great question. Race for the Wool is so old, I probably have to explain it because some of you might not even know what it is anymore. Um, it was one of the very first competitive games ever made for Minecraft and initially by Vex. And it also was one of the main like social starters for Minecraft content creators like myself. Uh, playing Race for the Wool led to me uh, playing on Minecraft, for example. And a lot of other communities formed as a result of the game. It was great, uh, especially in the early ages of uh, Minecraft YouTube. Anyways, uh, so Race for the Wool, it was a competitive game where you played on two long maps that were very narrow, side by side, identical maps to each other. And there was a, just a, enough of a gap where you uh, could shoot arrows between the two sides, like the two teams would shoot at each other. And you could launch TNT cannons to affect their side of the map and maybe blow up resources or cause some kind of damage, make it difficult for them to capture the wool, which was the objective of the game. Capture three different wolves and return them to a monument. Aha. Uh -huh. In my opinion, it was the greatest, to this day, the best Minecraft competitive game ever made. <laughs> and I'm very sad it's not being played. Like I genuinely believe it tested your Minecraft skills the best of anything. Like, if you think about it, it was a team game. Usually four p players were involved. So that on its own is a, a big Minecraft uh, skill challenge because you got to work together as a team. You have to communicate. You have to, you know, not yell at each other. That stuff is not everybody can do it, right? It's a, it's a big skill test. Um, it involved a lot of game uh, skills that 
are pretty important, like bridging, resource managing, you know, equipping your armor, crafting stuff quickly, uh, shooting arrows. The only thing that wasn't really covered in Race for the Wool was melee combat. On the fly thinking, you know, like if the other team got a wool, you were trying to stop them from getting, you had to change your strategy like really quickly or you're going to lose. Um, or, you know, a lot of times stuff wouldn't go as you planned. And that also meant uh, there was a lot of strategizing, uh, just like learning the maps, trying to understand the best strategy to locking down the other team or gaining an advantage of some sort. Uh, it was almost endless. Like you could always find ways of saving time. As for whatever happened to Race for the Wool, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. It just kind of died out, petered out over time. Um, I think because, like, new games were coming out, like the Hunger Games, you know, Bed Wars, that kind of stuff, uh, people kind of gravitated towards those, and the old games kind of died out because, like, everybody knew them and played them, and they were looking for something new, maybe. And then map makers stopped making maps for the game. You really needed new maps all the time for it. And if there was nothing new, it's like, why are you playing it, right? There's nothing exciting to check out anymore. Um, generally, though, if I was to guess, it's because it had other issues as well. <laughs> so from my experience, we played it in the Midnight Society a few times, you know, because we were always looking for new PvP games. And it was fun for a little bit, but it was also like a competitive game, right? It's not like a game you play for fun with your friends. Um, it's competitive, and if you're on the losing team, it does not feel good to play a lot of the times. Um, and yeah, some people got stomped, and then they didn't want to play anymore, so it just kind of died out in, in Midnight Society as well, even. <laughs> uh, and then there's also the issue of like, oh, you need a 4 versus 4 that's, and they're willing to sit down for two hours to play a full game, while a lot of the other games is like, oh, it's 30 minutes, and you know, you can have any number of players, and... You know, it, it was hard to arrange as well. I think it was a big factor. Uh-huh. But I would love to see it played again. I think it could be really cool. I thought it was a very fun game to watch as well. But, uh, yeah. You need map makers first off. That's the first step. Anyways, hopefully you guys enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for watching. Until the next one, take care, have a good day, and bye-bye.